The course from this point on deals primarily with what happens to money when we move it through the element of time, when we introduce time into the equation. And we know, from even from what we've already studied, uh, especially when we looked at index numbers and so on, that as money moves through time, its value changes. We need more dollars to do the same things, for example. So that's what we want to look at, and we want to visualize this with something called a timeline. And we will be using the timeline from this point on for simple interest, and for compound interest, and for annuities, basically all the way through the rest of the course, and on into next semester for that matter. So let's take a look at the basic construct, and I will apply this to simple interest since it's the topic you're likely on at this point in the course. So but we draw a basic line which goes on in both directions forever, and that is to indicate time. And what we do is we pick a, a, a point on it where we want this to begin, and we indicate uh, where that is, and it, it could be now, for example, and if it's now, uh, normally we would indicate that uh, with a zero saying this is the point at which money is starting and then it's going up to some other point in time, let's say one year. So as we proceed to the right, time is marching on. So this is now and this is a year from now. Now I'm taking that time frame because that's the basic definition for simple interest. Simple interest is normally interest that accrues for a year or less. There are some other features about simple interest. Uh, one of the major ones is that the, both the interest and the principal are both payable at the end of the agreement. So let's take a look at this. Let's say an amount of money is borrowed at this point in time, and we'll call that P for principal. And we'll bring that money ahead for the one year, and that becomes called the subsequent amount of money. And I believe that's the terminology your book is still using, so we'll use that for now. So we have a basic principle, and it's moving ahead to become a, a later amount of money, which we're calling the subsequent amount of money, or the sum, if you like. As money goes ahead, of course, we have to pay rent for using someone else's money, and we call that the interest. And you likely know from high school that the interest is calculated by multiplying the principal that you borrow times the rate you borrow it for times the time, the length of time, in which you've had the money. Now the rate is normally expressed as a decimal amount, so we'll make up a figure just uh, out of interest sake, let's say 10% per annum. Now that means if one year goes by, we will charge 10% interest. And we'll borrow a certain amount of money, let's say we borrow $1,000, and we have a time frame here that's one year. So if we substitute it into this formula, we would have the interest as the $1,000 times the rate of 10% times the time of one year. Now we'll write the 10% as a decimal, decimal one zero, and that's going to be $100 worth of interest that that money accrued, that we owe extra on top of the principal in order to pay this debt off. So we owe the $1,000 and the $100 of interest. So over here we could say this is equal to, the subsequent amount of money is equal to the principal that we borrowed plus the interest that we owe on that money also. There are two things that should be of particular note here. Uh, and they are that the interest rate here is quoted per annum, per year. So the time has to be in the same units. In the hard sciences like physics and chemistry, uh, we call this dimensional analysis. And we have to also use that in our formulas in business to make sure everything really is going to work out to be dollars in this case. So this is per annum, this has to be years. If this was so much a month, and a lot of charge cards, they don't want you to know how much it really is. So they might say it's 0 .0175 per month. And if that was the case, that it was so much per month, then this would be quoted as the number of months also. In this case, if it was one year, we would have 12 for 12 months if we were using a monthly rate here. So this is how it progresses. You'll have to try this with examples and become more familiar with it. Now just coming here for a minute, so I don't want to make this clip too long, 
Uh, when we come over here, uh, one thing mathematicians love, if you give them two formulas, they'll make at least a third one out of it. So what we've got here is S is P plus I, and they say, oh, that's great, because I was PRT. So they're going to substitute that in for the I, and they're going to say, well, that's really PRT. Now, one of the two things that was most uh, disliked in high school, probably among you when it, when it came to math, uh, was word problems and factoring. And this is the dreaded factoring coming up again. We see a common P in both uh, terms here. We take that out. It comes out of itself one time, and out of here, leaving the RT. So that's a familiar formula. You will have also that the future of value of money is equal to the principal times the quantity 1 plus the rate times the time. So you will be using this in your calculation. Now if you look at this, it has an exponent here which is understood to be 1. So this is S equals P times 1 plus RT to the power of 1. Now there's no 1 really there if you're looking hard at your monitor. There's no 1 there. But it's understood. If, we, if it was 2, we would have a 2 there. If it was 1 half, we would have 0.5 there. But it's not saying anything, so it's understood to be a 1. Now, if you'll just bear with me for another minute, uh, I would like to show you one other thing about this. So I'm going to take that off. And we now know, and I'll write the result here, that when you're going ahead in time, the future value with simple interest is equal to P times 1, the quantity 1 plus RT. I wonder what would happen if we went knew the subsequent amount of money and wanted to go backwards and find out the original principal. So we would take this money and we would take it back to here and we would say, well, if we know the subsequent amount of money, then what does the principal equal? Now, manipulating this formula, most of you are going to say, well, if S is equal to P, 1 plus RT, and I want to know what this P is, I would divide both sides by 1 plus RT. So I will divide by 1 plus RT, and divide here by 1 plus RT, leaving me the fact that P is equal to S divided by 1 plus RT. We know this formula is mathematically correct, but there's an easier way that you can write it that will make you be able to remember it in the future. Uh, so I would rather you, you think about doing it this way. How about if we say P is equal to S 1 plus RT to the minus 1. So it's the same formula because in high school you said X to the minus 1 means 1 over X anyway. So it's really exactly the same as this formula. So then why would I say you should learn it this way instead of this way? If you look at these two formulas, they're almost identical. So S is equal to P, 1 plus RT, with an exponent of plus 1. Plus 1 is understood. If it was anything else, we would write it there. So we don't put the 1 there, but it's understood to be plus 1. When we look at this formula, it looks identical. P is equal to S, the subsequent value of money, times 1 plus RT to the minus 1. This minus 1, remember, means that it's divided by, which makes it this become a smaller amount of money. So when we go back in time, the amount of money decreases. That's why that individual says they remember when they could go to the movie for a dollar. Because the amounts are getting smaller in the past because of devaluation and a lot of other things that happen with currency, as I said, as we move it through time. So this, see what I've developed here. So now we have P could be equal to S 1 plus RT to the minus 1. This term here, the 1 plus RT, is called the accumulation factor. It's the one that makes money grow in size as it moves ahead. That's why it has a positive exponent. Anything with a negative exponent will make the money decrease in size. So this is called the discounting factor. So this money gets smaller when it moves back in time. As we saw, again, when we talked about the consumer price index earlier in the course. One last thing. Just remember, when you studied geometry, and we had the x-axis and the y-axis, and we had money that we had time moving ahead, 
So when we went to the right of the origin, numbers were positive. So just remember, that's why we have a positive one here that we don't normally write. And when money went back in time, or when anything went back in time on an axis, and the uh, graphing if you like, we had negative numbers. So when this is going back in time, we have negative numbers, which makes this amount of money smaller. So recapping, when money goes ahead in time, it's going to normally get larger in size, a greater amount is required. When money goes back in time, it gets smaller, less money is required to do exactly the same thing. So try this with some examples and your instructor will explain more in class. Thank you very much.